939 and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of April 9, 2013 is hereby called to order. First item is the approval of agenda and order of priority. Are there any additions or deletions from the agenda? I move approval of the agenda. It's moved by John. Support. Ordered by Cassandra. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Let's get the Mertz, if you do intros, please. Good morning. Welcome to the State Board of Education meeting. I would like to introduce you to the people around the table. On my left is Mike Flanagan. He's the State Superintendent and Chairman of the Board. As we go around the table to the left, John Austin is President of the Board. He resides in Ann Arbor. Cassandra Albrich is the Board's Vice President. She resides in Rochester Hills. Dan Varner resides in Detroit. He's the Board's Secretary. Next to him, residing in Grand Rapids, is Lupe Ramos Montini, member of the board. Next to her, also from Grand Rapids Public Schools, the Michigan Teacher of the Year for this year, Bobby Jo Kenyon. She teaches math and science in West Ottawa High School. Ottawa Hills, I said that wrong, didn't I? Pardon me. In, gra <laughs> in Grand Rapids. Yes, in Grand Rapids. Across the table, Eileen Weiser, member of the board from Ann Arbor. Next to her, Kathleen Strauss, member of the board from Detroit. Michelle Fecto, also from Detroit, she is the board's NASB delegate. That's their association, National Associations of State Boards of Education. Next to me is the board's treasurer, Richard Ziley from Dearborn. Thank you. Thank you, Mertz. Just as we get started, <coughs> first of all, uh, Lupe, we want to express our sympathy to you and the loss of your brother. Thank you. Our, I understand you call him Rudy, but it's Rodolfo and you called them Rudy and you and your family have been in our thoughts and prayers. So. And then I'm going to, you know, I can't get through one of these meetings without something like this. So the lights can go down for just a second. And my excuse making for this is that we are a child oriented board and department. And uh, yeah, I have, we have a new grandson. Oh, wow. oh, oh congratulations. <laughs> He is a handsome little bugger, and he, um, some of you know Krista had some uh, some issues during her pregnancy, but everything is sorted out, and they're both healthy. Um, I'll mention later in my notes I was Sunday and Monday at a uh, I'm on the board of CCSSO, my counterparts, and we met with a Chinese delegation over the weekend, and uh, came back from the airport and stopped by, and um, they're doing well. They look a little tired, I think, you know. If you've had kids in this area or if you've experienced it yourself, you, you think you want to be alone for a while and then you realize, no, you need help. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you really don't want to be alone. <laughs> um, and then speaking of family, I thought I would mention, um, I probably should, I wanted to use this opportunity, this is the only place where anyone would care possibly, so it would have been a little, a little awkward for me to um, undo this you know, kind of with what? I don't know, a press conference? So instead, I just want to make it clear that, you know, I was on the radio and I was thinking out loud and um, thinking out loud and saying, well, yeah, I was thinking of running for Senate. Um, then I got home. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife had been listening to the radio that day. And, uh, you know, it was, what the heck are you even... And I said, well, I was just thinking out loud. There was a pause, and she says, you, you're prone to do this. This is not really helpful. Um, so th there's lots of reasons. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not, first of all, it's just not kind of my, my thing. Uh, probably more importantly, I'd have no chance of winning that kind of race. Um, but I do, I, I think something came out of this that I wanted to make mention today that I didn't anticipate. This was a Michael Patrick Shields show. It's very informal. And I think I hesitated for a split second, and he's pretty good. He was trained by uh, J.P. McCarthy. He used to be his right hand for years. And so he saw a pause, and what it was was just that, a pause. And in my head, it had just been announced that Senator Levin was, was, was closing his career. But what I, what I also want to say that came out of this is I was sitting Sunday next to my counterpart in Georgia at this Chinese uh, forum uh, in Boston. And uh, he, he's elected. 
Charlie Crist was the commissioner of education in Florida and eventually became governor. So I thought it's kind of interesting that if you run for office, it's kind of in the culture that that means you could run for office. And if you don't run for office, it's just not considered even in the, in the culture or in the mainstream. So I'm not doing this. I've never run, would never, never run. It's just, it, I think I'm pretty good at this. I'd be horrible at that. Um, but I do think maybe for some successors in this position down the road, um, I think if you're a Secretary of State, in some cases you've won a Secretary of State because it's a coattail issue with a governor and a whole thing, and then you're automatically maybe considered to be eligible for Congress or something. I just think there's something to be said and appreciate some of the dialogue that went on and MERS and Gong were in some other places that uh, would maybe let someone in this kind of position and others around the state that, you know, have, uh, haven't formally run for something but be, <coughs> be eligible and maybe even be thought about. But just to clarify, and uh, sorry if that kind of got away from me, and I'm working on um, not thinking out loud. This is my New Year's resolution a couple of months late. <laughs> so just appreciate the opportunity to clarify that. And then um, last night's game, you know, I'm not a Michigan alum, but I was really rooting for our state. But they still had a great season. And those of you like Sally who are more attached to this, we, we send our regrets. <laughs> so our first item today is a presentation on the adaptive system of school improvement support tools. And I think joining us at the table will be Sally Vaughn, Linda Ford, Albert Mayo. Is Albert here also? Yes. Albert's with Advanced Ed, but I'll let I'll let that. <coughs> Actually, Mike Albert's on the phone. Oh, okay. He's in, he's in Georgia. Okay. <coughs> Welcome, Albert. <laughs> Sally and Linda will make an introduction in just a moment. I, I just want to uh, <coughs> set the table for this a little bit. Seven year, several years ago, the department entered into a partnership agreement with Advanced Ed, and it reduced duplication of effort, and it opened possibilities of streamlined school improvement planning. This partnership also allowed local and intermediate school districts, as well as MDE staff, to see the school improvement plans. And this was really, this used to be North Central kind of, for those of us that knew that lingo. Um, this year, Michigan schools are uh, transitioning to Advanced Ed's new called Assist platform that will allow improved support and allocation of resources for schools. Uh, we're also pleased to have Kathy Sargent, I think, is here. Hi, Kathy. Uh, Kathy's really the Advanced Ed Michigan person. We've worked together for years. Very highly capable person. We're very lucky to have her in that position. She's just been a great partner. Um, and then we'd also, as I said, like to welcome Albert, but I'm going to turn it over to, to Sally and Linda at this point. Thank you. Um, as Mike mentioned, this is uh, a, new, a new platform, and probably about three or four years ago, we came to the board and made somewhat of a similar presentation so that you saw what the tool actually looked like. So we're pleased today to present to you the updated platform and the updated tool, which is uh, streamlined and technology keeps improving it over and over again. So I'm going to turn it over to Linda. Thank you. Um, and Albert is going to control this uh, presentation from Georgia, so he's, he's got control of the slides right now, and we'll uh, go through them uh, from Georgia. So, Albert, if you want to flip to the next slide. As Mike said, this is uh, a partnership uh, between Advanced Ed and MBE, and it has brought us a lot of good, good information and a lot of good opportunities. The first <coughs> collaboration between MDE, NCA, and Advanced Ed has helped us to streamline our school improvement process and minimi minimize duplication of effort. <coughs> when I was in a building as a principal, I had to do my North Central plan, I had to do my state plan, I had to do my Title I plan, I had to do my <coughs> plan and plan and plan. And so this has allowed us to bring a lot of pieces together and uh, the collaboration has caused the conversations to allow us to do that. Um, also, within the department, it's caused us to go into a lot of collaboration because as we put the plans together, we were able to bring Title I to the, to the table. We've been able to talk to Special Ed about some of the work they're doing and how do we integrate that. 
so that we don't have to have four plans competing within a building and four plans competing within the department. We can bring it all together in one plan. Um, in addition to that, I can't tell you how many times I'd go out into buildings and have districts, uh, buildings saying, well, I don't have to do a school improvement plan, I do the North Central plan. And, you know, there was not the law that said everybody but. And so we ended up with now we're down to one plan because North Central schools see the same planning process that the other schools do, and we do all the same plan. Um, we're using the common process and common technology platform, which is nice because now we can see everything. And uh, so can the ISDs, and they can access the work that their schools and districts are doing. The other nice piece is that we now have a uni unified project team and support team. And so there is one team that meets every Thursday morning and talks about uh, what needs to be done to the system and how we need to work on it. And I would like to just take a an opportunity to introduce part of that team, which is in the, in the row, back row here, um, Diane Jocelyn Gould, Diane Fleming, and Rennie Arroz, who help us with putting the system together and who also are our eyes and ears out in the field. So if there are ever any issues or anything that has to be worked out, these are the three people on our side of the organization that help get that work done. So they, they are actually the eyes and the ears of, for us. Um, so Albert, if you want to shift slides. <coughs> um, evolution of our work. I like to say that Albert and I started out in two different places in this country, he in Georgia and me here. I spent every morning for 25 days, so about a month and a half, in a room talking to them as we designed the first system. And our first focus was on the EDYES statewide reporting requirements, which we refer to as the <coughs> SPR 40 and 90. So that's a self-assessment that schools do in order to fulfill their EDYES requirement, but also they do it because it helps them focus on what parts of the system are not working well in order to uh, make those changes as they do their school improvement planning. Then we moved on to the adoption of a statewide school improvement plan, and that's for both schools and districts. Since then, we have added in the uh, state and federal requirements, including Title I, and so the Office of Field Services works with us very closely on making sure that those pieces are in place and that they are the same as those are required by their staff. Um, we since have added the school data analysis, and this year, the partnership has allowed all Michigan schools to access perception surveys which are normally only available to advanced ed members. And so without additional expense to the local school district, they can access all the perception surveys that are available on the advanced ed system. And um, we've also reached out, well, Deb reached out to us, or we reached out to her, I'm not quite sure how we did it, but the priority and focus schools are also needing to file plans, and in order to get them to just one plan, we've worked closely with Deb and we're, we're getting closer and closer to having our priority and focus schools only having to do one plan as well. So that's another one of the partnerships. Albert? Can you flip? Thank you. So the ASSIST framework, I'm going to turn a lot of this over to Albert, but this is just a very exciting um, way to look at things. We have, there's a comprehensive analysis system built into the new platform. The improvement actions are pretty much what they used to be as far as the content of the product, but inside of those, for instance, schools frequently have difficulty writing a good objective and including what the measurable piece of that will be and putting it all to play. And I think Albert's going to be able to demonstrate to you how they just put in, schools now just put in some information and the system writes the objective for them. And then they can modify it if they want to edit it, but it, it'll do the work for them and help them. There's a place for some networking to go on and then performance and diagnostics. And Albert, I know you know some other details about this that you might want to share with the team and some of the future work that we have in mind. Okay, thank you, Melinda. Um, first of all, um, can you all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. All right, I've got some echo on my line, but uh, I'll do the best I can. Um, I'd like to give you a brief presentation of ASSIST. Um, I will begin with an overall uh, discussion and then jump to the system where I will show you a few screens. So as Linda mentioned, ASSIST is very much a framework that can be adapted to meet um, local needs for the district and also state needs and federal needs. What we did is we looked at the domain of 
um, school improvement and also accreditation and created a platform that is unified and is not specific to advanced ed and can be customized to um, an organization such as the State Department that has uh, all different kinds of, of needs. And we look at the framework in terms of four quadrants. The performance and diagnostics um, make up a set of components that are needed for internal and external review. And I'll talk a little bit about those. Comprehensive analysis is basically the bridge between doing that internal and external review and then creating goals and plans. The improvement to actions is all about the specific goals and plans and activities that will take place to create change. And then learn and collaborate is sort of this space where uh, peers can connect and we can glean out best practices. So if we go back to the performance and diagnostic qu uh, quadrant, some of the specific components that we have in there uh, the executive summary is basically a diagnostic that allows a school or a district uh, to be able to tell their story in narrative form. So we have a, a set of key questions that are intended to uh, provide an opportunity to identify uh, the achievements, the opportunities for improvement, and those things that make that institution great. Um, that summary could be done at any time, and uh, that is one of the components that we have embedded into the overall school improvement report. The SDR 40 and 90, I'm sure you're very familiar with that. And then the equivalent component for NCA, which is self-assessment. It's basically a diagnostic that is in rubric form that is based on uh, standards and indicators. Um, so this is aligned with the school improvement framework that Michigan has with the 40 and 90 key characteristics. Uh, in the case of uh, advanced ed and CA, we have five standards and a set of indicators that belong to those five standards. And it's an opportunity for the institution to self-assess itself to do this internal review, and that informs the process of improvement and eventually the creation of, of plans. Uh, the school data analysis is similar in nature in the fact that a school is self-assessing itself, but it's looking at its data. It's looking at achievement data, and in the school data analysis, we have targeted questions about the data to help the process of thinking of the meaning of that data in the eventual creation of goals and plans. Perception surveys is another domain of the uh, what would make up a comprehensive school improvement uh, analysis because we want schools not only to, to assess themselves, but we want schools to, uh, to ask stakeholders uh, what they think of them. So we have um, parent surveys, we have staff survey, and uh, student survey. And we have those in multiple languages. We've implemented uh, Spanish, Portuguese, um, Mandarin, Arabic, and Haitian Creole. Uh, we provide those surveys online. We provide them also on paper. Uh, and that component has been very well received. External review at this moment is something that is more specific to advanced ed and NCA. Basically, it's a set of, uh, it's a process that is made up of diagnostics and reports that are used by an external team to assess the performance of an institution. And that could be applied at a school level and also at a district level and even beyond. Uh, and that component we expect to uh, open up to um, be able to service multiple types of external reviews, not only the ones that pertain to accreditation, but those that may be needed for other purposes. Program evaluation is another diagnostic that has yet to be rolled out, and this is under the leadership of Mike's office. 
in which uh, this component is going to help evaluate the um, performance of programs. Any questions about performance and diagnostics before I move on? Cassandra, please. One quick question. You talked about targeted questions that get to the data analysis. Can you give an example of what what one of those targeted questions would be? Uh, I can. I think Diane Fleming may be the best person to answer the question, but one of the questions is to look at holistically at the data and identify those areas in which, um, from an achievement point of view, the institution may be struggling. Uh, and then begin to ask questions about why that is the case. So the idea is to get them to think about the, the meaning of the data before just only looking at a symptom and then jumping to the creation of a goal. Diane, would you like to add to that? And, and so basically what happens is that the school will look at all the data that they have and synthesize it and decide what do they have to do to get better. And so they'll talk about their limited English proficient. They'll they'll talk about different subgroups and decide what what is it that we have to do to get better. I have a question. Thank you, Michelle. Please. Um, the data that's collected is it available through to anybody. Um, the the data that most schools use actually comes from the My School Data Portal mm -hmm. through CEPI, and yes, that is available to the public without any uh, password. Yes. So that would, what would be the, um, myschooldata.org. Myschooldata.org and then subset to the building. Good question. Yeah, it's, it's MI, not MY. Yeah. Albert, we have a little musical interlude and then we'll. <laughs> okay. No, would you like to continue? Yes, thank you. Um, okay, moving on to comprehensive analysis, uh, that is made up uh, essentially of what we call root cause analysis. So this is the bridge between looking at the data, at the hard numbers, and create, the creating a goal and the plans made up of the goals. The, uh, the idea behind this component is to provide a structured methodology that would enable uh, some deep thinking. Um, for example, um, in looking at the data, uh, typically there's a lot of symptoms that the data would show, but the root cause of the problem may be several layers deep. Um, uh, poor achievement in a particular content area in a particular classroom may be evident from the data, but perhaps the, the reason for that may be uh, a high turnover of teachers, and perhaps the reason for that may be uh, lack of professional development, and so on and so on. So the purpose of root cause is to provide a way to uh, think about those things, as opposed to just looking at a symptom and then saying, I want to create a goal that is very specific to that, that symptom. And what a SIS will do is basically pull data from within the system, all these diagnostics that have been already entered into the system, and look at other areas of the, of the system where we can help the user uh, think through a root cause analysis uh, process. And um, that this is something that is in the making. Uh, we're making progress, but it has not yet been rolled out. And we'll be working closely with the project team to um, figure out when it's the best time to put it out there. But I just wanted to let you know that this is coming, and we're trying to embed more of a comprehensive approach to think through the creation of goals and, and plans. Uh, improvement actions have to do all about goals, um, the, the, the objectives that are within those goals, the strategies, and the activities. It is a structured approach. I will show you, show you what that looks like in a moment. Um, assurance is, is another form of um, self-assessing and asking specific questions uh, that may be more along the lines of yes or no. Do you have a um, crisis intervention plan? 
Do you have a variant comp cap, comp, comp cap plan? Uh, all these uh, things that are yes, no, and then be able to provide a comment and then an attachment that goes with it, uh, supporting documentation. The improvement plan is basically the combination of, of the diagnostics and all the things that went into the creation of the goals, including the goals themselves. So that pulls everything together in a nice uh, big PDF, and we have a workflow that goes with that report where a district is able to review a school's plan and be able to comment on it and then eventually uh, approve it. Improvement monitoring has to do with the ability to monitor the progress of the plan and be able to essentially indicate the, the status of that plan. Uh, any questions so far on goals and strategies and plans? Looks like we're okay. Please okay. continue. And then Learn and Collaborate is an area that uh, has yet to be developed. That has to do with how do we bring together um, communities of individuals that have the same kind of interest, perhaps the same kind of dif difficulties, in a medium that where they can share information, establish peer connections, and then out of that space be able to glean out what would be best practices. Um, we're looking at different ways to do this, including perhaps the use of social media. Uh, we're just sort of working our way through uh, assist trying to make sure that we have the, you know, the critical content first and then move on to this other section. So uh, if there are no other questions, I'd like to move on and talk about some future work. First of all, I wanted to mention that uh, every year we work with a project team that is being led by Darren Fleming to put, up, put through the system of school improvement uh, some 3,600 schools and 850 districts that uh, go through the system to self-assess themselves and create their school improvement plans. And this is a fairly major activity. Uh, program evaluation diagnostic tool is, as I mentioned, this is coming out of Mike Rathke's office and we'll be working closely with uh, him and his team to roll out this tool. Uh, we have a community survey that we just rolled out in addition to the parent, uh, staff, and student surveys. We're working on the translations in different languages for that survey. Uh, also, we have been working very closely, as Linda indicated, with the, uh, the SRL office in being able to, in to integrate uh, the needs of that office with the overall school improvement process that Linda has been uh, leading over uh, the last few years with our system. So the idea is that now focus schools and priority schools uh, do work in the system like all other schools, and the current plan uh, has been fairly narrative in nature. They would like to begin to use goals as evidence for the um, responses to the diagnostics that are for priority and focus schools. Uh, another point is that we're working with Diane Fleming and her team to be able to pull out of the system uh, statewide data to be able to look at um, overall what types of uh, strategies and work is being done in school improvement and we're looking at ways in which this information can be used for uh, state planning, but also planning at the local level. And then, of course, as I mentioned, we have ongoing meetings uh, with the project team, but also with a core team of uh, ISD individuals to look at enhancements, to get feedback, to find out what is working and what is not working from the field. All right. Um, any questions about future work? All right. The default answer is no. <laughs> uh, in terms of the contacts, I just wanted to mention these are the three key individuals. Uh, 
we've already been introduced. And we make sure that we connect at specific times to make sure we're all in sync. And we've got our teams that are in the trenches doing all the heavy lifting. So you have that information in case you ever need to contact any one of us. Um, next, I wanted to jump into just a brief demonstration of assist. Uh, any questions before I move on? No, go ahead, Albert. All right. So I'm going to try to move this over here. And let's see. I am going to blow this up. Okay, hopefully that's big enough. I know you've got a very long room. Uh, so this is a glimpse of assist. Um, I will be very brief um, because there's a lot of information here and I don't want to overload you with information, but I want to show you some key things. So this is the screen where users, uh, when they first log in, this is where they land. And what they see is that very clearly what is upcoming and what has been completed. I'm showing you a test in school, so some of this data may not be exactly representative of what may be uh, shown for some Michigan schools, but it, you get the, the basic idea. It's very clear when I, what I have to do and when it's due. Uh, over the top, there is a navigation uh, set of tabs, which if I go from left to right, pretty much it gives me the sequence. The profile is all about the school's uh, demographics uh, and basically their classification such as Title I school-wide, Title I targeted. Uh, diagnostic surveys is, uh, has to do with all of these internal diagnostics that I mentioned before. The executive summary, the SPR 40, the SPR 90, the self-assessment, um, and eventually the performance evaluation. These are things that are helping uh, schools uh, diagnose th themselves. Uh, surveys is self-explanatory. We have the four surveys, four surveys that I mentioned. <laughs> Assurances are yet no questions with the ability to attach att supporting documentation. Goals, uh, I will go into that in a moment to show you what, that it look what it looks like. This is where you create your goals in a structured manner and put the goals into a plan. Actions and reviews, uh, this is more pertaining to the diagnostic reviews that uh, NCA does of our schools that are being visited and eventually can be opened up for other kinds of reviews. And that portfolio is where things end up in terms of the body of work and being able to um, collect all the information uh, into a PDF. So I'm going to go into goals and plans and just um, show you what that looks like in terms of creating um, a goal. And I think I need to make this a little smaller so you can see it. Okay. So basically, what you see here is a set of goals, and I will create one in a moment so you see what that looks like. Within a goal, you have objectives, and you can have one or many. Strategies are contained within objectives, and activities are contained within strategies. Um, the goals are listed here, and sometimes there may be a status such as goal being incomplete, in which case you can click on the goal itself and finish up, create the strategies, create the activities. Um, I will go ahead and create one now so that you can see what it looks like and then I'll come back and show you the end product. So when I create a goal, I'm being put through a wizard that is has four steps. First is creating the goal name, then the objectives, then the strategies, and then the activities. Um, so this is I'll just come up with a very simple case. Um, um, improve mathematics. Okay. Next, the question is, is this an academic goal or an organizational goal? I'll choose academic for right now. 
Step two is to create the objective. Now, the objective is going to be very structured because we want the objective to be measurable. So the question is, <coughs> who is the target population? What do they need to achieve? How will success be measured? And when, when will they achieve it? All right, so we'll proceed with that. In the objective, I need to first identify the population. Um, first question is, is it a specific <coughs> population, meaning is there a subgroup or all students? Let's say it's a specific population. I can identify the gender. I can identify the particular grades. And I can identify the particular subgroup. Now, this information is specific to the school. So already we're personalizing the information that we're showing to the institution because it's their data. It's not just all grades, all subgroups. So next, I'm, I'm being asked, what is the proportion? The proportion can be a count, a percentage, percentage decrease of or increase of. Let's say it's a percentage, and I say 85%. Then the next question is, is what? What is the content area? Let's say it's mathematics. These content areas, uh, we've been working with um, Linda Fleming, um, sorry, Diane Fleming, to make sure that it's representative of the institutions in Michigan. Target population should, the uh, choices collaborate to, complete a portfolio or performance, demonstrate a behavior, demonstrate a proficiency. Let's say we choose demonstrate a proficiency um, in problem solving. All right, so I continue to build the measurable objective. How is this going to be measured? This objective will be measured by, let's say, uh, MEEP. By when? So then I choose the target date. Let's just say I give it. Um, I don't know, about a year here. Oops, there we go, April 9th. Okay, then when I preview, I see already what I'm building. 85% of male, Hispanic, or Latino third grade students will demonstrate a proficiency in problem solving in mathematics by April 9th, 2013, as measured by me. <laughs> so the difference here between uh, creating a, a free form objective and this uh, structure is that this is all data centric. So in, uh, in the future, if I want to look at what subgroups are being targeted, what is the, um, what, how is it going to be measured, what's the target date, what is the percentage, these are all already data points in the system. I can accept this and continue. Next step is the strategy. Um, so the strategy or intervention is made up of a name. So let's say um, problem solving within teams, um, work in small teams of three or four students. I can preview that. I'm sorry, I meant to show you as well. I can identify the research as well at, for the particular strategy. And we know that's something that's needed for Title I. Then I can preview and I can see you know, what I've already entered into the system. Except I continue to take me to the activity level. Uh, we give a couple of examples to um, make sure the to see the type of activities that are needed. This is where you get very specific about the, the work. So that what are the, the actions that will take place? Um, activity name, uh, let's say uh, long division. Uh, activity type, this is where we specify um, the type of activity. And a good example of that is professional learning. So. As you can see, some of the data that begins to uh, uh, become available is going to be based on how we classify the information. So let's say I choose uh, academic support program. 
and uh, after school tutoring. And then I can get very specific in terms of the start date and in terms of the end date. Then I choose the funding source. And again, this is where I, um, this information is specific to uh, the work in Michigan. So for example, I can say um, Title I Part B, uh, funding amount, I put the amount, responsible staff. Okay, and then I preview. And then the system will tell me what I've entered uh, already. Accept and finish. So I've completed this one goal, and as you can see, it's forming this goal tree. I have several actions I can do within each node. I can edit, I can add uh, more components to the node, I can add a progress node. So a progress node is basically, uh, in narrative form, uh, information about that level. I can do that at the goal level, the objective level, strategy, and activity. And also, as you saw as I hover over, it's showing me the full extent of the information that I have entered into the system. Okay, so these notes have to do with uh, progress monitoring. Uh, next, what I'd like to do is show you how this, this information begins to roll up. Uh, let me pause for a moment. I know I just give you a lot of information in case somebody has a question and you'd like to ask it at this point. I don't see any hands, so if you'd proceed, and I know we're running a little over time. Okay. Almost done. So within goals and plans, I have these tabs. Um, I'll go to reports right now. Uh, I have a couple of different types of reports. I can do a strategy report. I can do an activity report. If I click on strategy report, it's going to ask me to select uh, the level that I want to report at. So for example, um, if I want to look at this at the ISD level, right now it's showing me all the ISDs that I have access to. Uh, so if I'm a state official, like Linda or Diane, I'll be able to see this. Select the goal type, academic, uh, content area, any content area that I want, or just all of them. Uh, the grade, the gender, the subgroup, measure objective status. So if I want to look at all goals that uh, are in progress or that have been met, I can do that. The, uh, the start date for the report. Mm -hmm and the end date. And this is where I want to include um, uh, only goals that are in plans or just all goals. And then what I do is I export to Excel, and this is queuing up uh, this very large report into our system, and then what's going to happen is the end user is going to get an email message when the report is ready, and with a link, you go to the link and you get this Excel sheet that has an entire spreadsheet with all of the information that uh, applies to that institution or set of institutions. So that's how the report um, rolls up. And uh, in the end, the final product is these um, plans, which are basically containers of goals. So if I open a particular plan, I can see that this plan has three goals, and I can pick and choose what goals I want in, in a plan. I can have a single plan. I can create separate plans if needed for internal use. Let's say I have a focus on technology, and I want to include only technology goals because I want to discuss those within the institution. I can do that as well. Thanks, Albert. Um, Thank so you. I know that we've gone over time, so I'll stop right there. Thank you very much. I know that there, there are tons of details in here, but I hope you can see from what he was just demonstrating how we're going to be able to utilize 
the information at a district, a large district level especially, uh, to determine what's going on in that district, where they might want to focus their funding, what they might need to do for support. At the ISD levels, they're making plans for uh, professional learning and some supports for the school districts. They'll be able to roll it up to see what's going on across. And for us, of course, we'll be able to look at, at what's going on. So I find this piece of it just really useful t at, at a state level as well as the other levels below that. So, and I'm so grateful, Albert, for you going through this and, and giving us just a brief overview of some of the components. Thank you so much. Sally? Mike? Albert, thank you. That was a great job. And the comment on time didn't mean to take as much time as we want to take here. So that we just want to make sure there was that for you. So OK. Thank you very much. Stay, no, stay on. We're, we may need you. Is <laughs> okay. that right? Yep. Yep. Don't go yeah. away. We're going to still yep. see. So are any board questions or comments? I know you've had some in the Dan. Um, so thank you for all of this. Um, I think three questions. So I'll uh, I can hold the other two if other folks have questions and come back. Um, I think the first question is so I get why this is helpful to the MDE. Um, it helps you kind of get the a quick easy access to the information and the picture that you need around what school improvement plans are happening and so on and so forth. How is this helpful to schools? Um, I think you touched on that early, but I just want to make sure that I really get it. For me, what okay, I see, yeah. what I see as being helpful for the school districts and the school buildings is that it, it puts all of their required work in one place. Before, as I said, they had several plans, and if you have several plans, nothing gets done because we're into a fight about which part of resources are we going to use for what. And this brings all of the plan components together. So I've got my Title I pieces in there. I've got if I've got some considerations to do for North Central Advanced Ed, if I've got um, a, pri a priority or a focus school, all of that's coming together in one place. So now the staff can focus on all of it, pare it down to a manageable amount, and then move forward with that and stop the, the debate over well, which, which plan's more important in this building. So maybe just one quick follow-up question. Um, I, is this at all related? So it seems like last year at some point in time we got a report on uh, the department's effort to reduce paperwork and duplication yes. and redundancy uh, in the lives of school administrators and, you know, at the department level and so on. Is this at all related to that? Precisely. Well, we started this before that, but it was Mike's vision along with Mark Elgart from Advanced Ed who signed the partnership so that we wouldn't have a redundancy bet with North Central Advanced Ed schools doing a plan for Advanced Ed and a plan for the state. And that used to be what happened. So the first piece was to bring those pieces of work together. And as you see, then, as we began that work, we said, well, wait a minute, we've got, we've got Title I, and we need to get that in there. And oh, we've got this piece, and now we've got the SRO requirements. And so how do we bring that all together into one plan for the schools? So yes, it reduces the paperwork. It reduces the redundancy, we hope. And that's, that's included in the number that was shared with us last year, whenever that was, that I, I don't remember what it was off the top of my head, but it was a significant number of kind of duplicative reports that have been eliminated. Is this included in that number? You know, maybe yeah, not because we already had it going, but the spirit of it we like you repeating because I think there's, <laughs> it's just human nature. You know, we always feel, I feel like we have too much that we have to report to the feds. And then when you're pushed specifically, Emma, what is that? You realize, well, it's not really that bad. This, I think, the more we can remind folks, this was a big initiative to consolidate all this. And, uh, and as Linda said, it really wasn't, it was prior to that, so it wasn't driven by the paperwork thing. It was driven by ease of uh, local districts and also by kind of coordination, as she said. You know, I, I would also say that it, 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 otherwise school improvement's kind of this big nebulous picture until you see the, what I've learned the term here is the granular nature of specific decisions <coughs> made by teachers and others in the system. So they very specifically say, okay, well, Diane needs to, you know, what I think this informs, by the way, which I don't think got a lot of play in the legislative um, <coughs> angst to get to teacher evaluations, was that it's meant to be how do we improve our skills, not how do we punish for not being up to mm -hmm. speed yet. Mm -hmm. And this really lays the groundwork for, okay, I'm Mike. I, I'm responsible for this piece in mathematics and here's here's some strategies for how I'm going to get there. One of them is I'm going to attend professional development at the intermediate. Another is I'm going to read this book on by. And it, 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 all these little pieces then add up to improvement in that one sub-goal. 
But I think otherwise, I mean, I've done this for years. I, I think I'm realizing it's another reason not to run for anything. I'm like an historical relic here because mm. my first North Central chairmanship was, I think, in the late 70s. And I went to a high school. And for those of you who did these things way back then, you'd count the books that were in the library. Right. You'd literally count them. You'd estimate how many on a shelf and you'd go and you'd all come together. And t you didn't care who actually took the books out. You know, they could have just been sitting there. But that was a measure of kind of uh, inputs, uh, inputs, inputs rather than outputs. And then even when you said whether they came out, I mean, with Joseph and assessments trying to get at, so, you you know, we have a high level of kids who took these books out, but did it translate to learning? And I think it's just, it, it's it, frankly, you know, it wasn't my vision really. It was a team here, and I thought it, I wasn't as sure as it turned out to be this great kind of mm -hmm. product. I was sure it would get there in time, but it's really... Excellent. You, you please follow, and you're welcome, John. Um, so anything that uh, kind of both streamlines and improves access to information is undoubtedly a good thing. Uh, so um, let me just get that on the record. I guess my last question is probably more a thought than a question. Is I'm really struck by the importance of the. Um, the two lighter shaded pieces of the assist framework, this uh, comprehensive analysis and root cause analysis stuff, and then to collaborate. Um, I think over the last decade, we've built pretty big muscles as a sector around um, gathering data, all the performance and diagnostics work, uh, and all of the kind of setting improvement goals and actions and so on. I don't think we've yet gotten very good as a sector at that root cause analysis work, at using, at figuring <laughs> out from the data what's actually real and what's meaningful and kind of what the right activity might be. Uh, that's just, I'm struck by how critically important that is. Without it, you end up, you know, headed in, the, in a wrong or at least a, in an effective direction. And then I'm also struck by the fact that these are really complex systems. I mean, so you can be an expert teacher and you won't get the same result with every kid, right? This isn't like an easily replicable um, process. Uh, and so the learning and collaboration kind of piece of this is critically important if you're going to course correct along the way, which you're going to have to do in any complex system. Um, so I just want to, just a quick plug, I hope that as this goes forward, I understand that the, that root cause analysis piece, so I got from Alex that it's not, or Albert, that it's not uh, yet in place but coming. Hope we can accelerate that, really put some energy into making that a useful, useful exercise uh, for administrators and, and teachers and the like. You know, I, we just an aside, when our last week when Landon was born, and I sit there and think about, I think the reason even with some of the complications that he's healthy is he had top of the line prenatal care and we don't have that across the board and then we're still trying to get kids to read a grade level at third grade I mean so what are some of the root causes they're often not right at the easily described well that's a bad teacher you know I mean it's it's as we've we all know we're singing to the choir with this but I think the more we can get these guys and others to report that to general folks it's helpful because uh, that's the simplistic notion in some of the policies that it's, they're not mean-spirited, perhaps, but they don't get at what we're really trying to do. And thanks for that comment. Eileen had one. I, I actually one. have a couple, but the, uh, the first one is how excited I was to see this and how excited I was to see it combined with the proposed teacher leader standards uh, on the same agenda. It was great. Uh, when is it going to be operational? Schools are using this right now. That's what I was going to ask. And what kind of reception are you getting? Uh, are, they, are, are some schools... Um, are, are how many schools are able to dig deeply into it and really use it, and how many are just nibbling at trying to figure out uh, what the, what these uh, uh, items mean to change for change? Uh, my latest report on if you go to that upper quadrant, which is where most of the schools are right now with their uh, re annual reporting, is that 95% of the schools are in and doing that piece. I think the critical element that you just raised is so now I've gathered all that data, I've answered all those questions, now what do I do with that data over in the green quadrant and then down into the improvement piece? We have ISDs across the state that are providing support and we get feedback from them. Right now because this one's new, it's kind of mixed, we'll be interested in seeing what, that, what the answer to that question is. 
going forward. We have been excited with the old platform that schools got deeper than they ever had before. So we're hoping this one will take them to your point, Mr. Varner, even deeper. So a follow-up, which is actually a presage to the next item. Um, in, in the conversations that I'm having with people, I see, uh, and, and recently a number of us were interviewed by a teacher uh, prep uh, student at Central Michigan. And uh, one, the last question she asked is, what would you tell someone going into teaching at this point? And I said, well, mm. you can either look at it as a, as a free trip to Pluto um, or uh, you know, are we venturing into the Wild West? But the bottom line is that for somebody coming out of ed school in the next five years, uh, the the driving back this sort of information and the need to gather it and the and the how to fix um, uh, uh, education is really vital in the teacher preparation institutions. And for both of these items coming up, I think that there's a continuing conversation. I know that we're con we're we're. Um, re, uh, requesting and urging more and more topicality mm -hmm. for the uh, teacher preparation institutions, but there's a reason, which is that we're able finally to take things that we know can work and translate them to the <coughs> schools. And I don't want to see any teacher prep candidate coming through one of our TPIs in five years who's not ready to rock and roll on this. I think it's really important that we that we that we think about that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> well, my first reaction was the. I remember having presentations here about when we went into schools to help them and well, the first thing they were told was you have to get all your plans together because they all had all these different plans. That was the first, they, then, that was the undergirding thing for everything. So to be doing this is really helpful. I mean, it, should, it probably should have been done a long time ago, but the glad it's being done now. And I think what, what Dan was saying is that it, if it helps the, the teachers and the people and the principal and the teachers to work together, and I'm not sure how that happens. Does each individual teacher do this whole process or does the principal do it? Is there a team that does it? How does this work? State law requires that there be a school improvement team and so does the, right. the federal thing. And so ideally this team comes together and answers the questions and formulates those goals, as you saw, mm -hmm. and, and puts together the plan. That's the ideal, and that's what we see pretty much uniformly across the state. I won't tell you that there aren't some principals at the last moment filling out, no. madly right. filling something out, but <coughs> in general what we train to is a team of people, teachers okay. and administrators in the building working on these plans. Okay. Chris Morning. Michelle, please. Thanks. Yeah. For that. Um, so so is it required of schools to use it or they voluntarily can use it or how does it present it to them? And I also wanted to know what schools are not using it. <coughs> well, just a minute, let me get it back. Okay. Well, it's it's not going to want um, to. Oh. I'll turn this to you and I'll answer the question. <laughs> um, Title I schools are required to use it because it's the, it's the ability of Title I schools to um, show that they're meeting all the requirements and so they are required to use it. That also means that almost all the districts in the state have to use it. So we have pretty much uniform acceptance of this program and this plan. All advanced ed schools have to use it. So across the board we're getting, as I said, 95 percent of the schools have already done their work for, for this this year. We, the, the reporting percentages show me that about 99 percent of the schools in the state are using this, this platform and, and utilizing it. 99. Yeah. 99. 99. So this applies also to charter schools? And yes. They're a, they're a public school. PAA schools. They're a public okay. school. So they're all mm -hmm. using that and that data is it available and accessible? What data? The data that is collected through the performance so and diagnostics. So can, the, I don't believe that we <coughs> have the data forward fa facing, for, which means going out to the public, for what their, their um, their diagnostic yields up. We try to keep that for them to utilize for conversations within their own building. However, the results of that, the school improvement plan is forward facing, as are the um, SPR 40 and 90, the diagnostics that we alluded to earlier. Okay. The advanced ed schools do have some forward facing elements that we've not required of all state schools. Okay, so how, okay, so, so I'm just, so that data about uh, performance and things like that is is in there who has access to that are you talking about the student performance that's yeah, that's well, also in my all of that is already already there with my school data okay so that's already available it's okay. what 
what is not um, uniformly available is the conversation that teachers have and the results of that. What you see eventually, the results you eventually see, is what they put in the school improvement plan that they've decided is important for them to work on. Okay. What you don't see is the analysis that they're doing internally. Okay. You know, my, I, if I could just use, for me anyway, the even pre being an educator, the the idea where data was going to be valuable was, I mean, as a kid in New York City, and, and I wore a, a Jackie Robinson shirt and a Mickey Mantle hat, two opposing, you were either a Brooklyn fan or a New York fan. By the way, I think that helped me lay the groundwork for working with both Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in that, I, the reason I'm mentioning it is I really thought in my head I was a better baseball player than I actually was. And part of it started that you understand the we data. All do. Huh? We all do. We all then, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the data about, and what, you know, this is simplistic in a way, but it wasn't about your fielding. Eventually the coach would say, well, you field fine. You strike out all the time. So, I mean, it's, it's simplistic in a way, but it's, it's really that simple to some degree in schools where if they're not specific about what is your weakness and how do you turn that around. And then to Michelle's question, the results, I mean, I still think the best tool we have is the top to bottom list. I know some think it's, too simplistic in some ways, and that's why in myschooldata.org you can go anywhere you want with it. But pretty much, you know, that's saying where you are, and there's, there's, it's a very complicated, uh, thoughtful metric that gives credit for growth and all that. So, I mean, that's a quick and easy place to say, well, this school is touting itself, kind of where are they? My son and daughter-in-law, other grandkids you've, you've seen at times, they, they, he took a job at U of M, she's at Oakland University, so they've just bought a house this weekend. And they found, uh, they, where did she go? MySchoolData.org. She wanted to get a sense of where that elementary school was within the system. You know, because the system has an image to it sometimes. I, I know I've shared this before, but the system in Farmington that I was superintendent of 20 years ago, it was very um, different depending on which school. The aggregate scores were all up here, and we had some schools that were just not, you know, and we didn't, we didn't know it. We didn't really focus on it because we said, well, everything's looking good. So, I mean, this has been a cultural change to accept data, and I'm sorry to harp on this, but the reason I think some of the legislation, whether it was intended to be helpful or not, was not in, this, in the debate because it felt like a punishment tool as opposed to what we've been working on for 20 years, which is use this to improve, use data to improve, not we're going to have data to gotcha. Mm -hmm. You know, that's been the, kind of the catch-22 here. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Does this also include the deficit elimination plan as no. part of this? So no, that plan would have to be separate? But this is for, sc for school personnel to figure out in a building mm -hmm. how they're going to address the needs to greater, to increase the achievement levels of their students. Okay, so, so this is about student achievement. So it's about academic, it's not about academic stuff. Mm -hmm. okay. Please, Bobby Jones. As a teacher that works uh, with the school improvement plan, this is much appreciated. And, and this, the simplicity of writing some of those goals and objectives for you, I know that we're getting ready to start writing ours, and it's going to be wonderful to be using these. Um, the other thing that I was excited about was the learn and collaborate piece. Mm -hmm. I think that's an essential piece that's really been missing, and it's hard for schools to find another school to collaborate or to have that time. And being part of the Michigan Institute for Instructional Leaders, which was based on bringing schools together that were in that, that bottom percent to collaborate with each other, the tremendous growth that we've had in all of our schools because we've all share something in common, we have the same common difficulties or problems and interests, and we can look at the best practices to help our group, I think that's really exciting, and not to reinvent the wheel, but to to say what's working with you, and, and I, I think that's going to be a piece that a lot of schools will really love. We're looking forward to that one. Well, great. Thank you. This is thank, very thank helpful. You very and, uh, hope thank you, board. Albert. Thanks, Albert. Appreciate your beaming in from Atlanta. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to present, and I hopefully uh, I will do a follow-up at some point. Thank you, sir. You have to get off now. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're welcome to stay and listen the rest of the... No, thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Our next item, uh, Sally, is being joined by Flora Jenkins, and it's the presentation on the proposed Michigan Teacher Leader Standards. Um, well, I'll let, I'll let them speak to that. I sometimes end up jumping on their, on their introduction. We are pleased to bring these standards to you for first presentation, and then we'll take them out for public comment and come back to you. But uh, you may recall that in the last year we went to a three-tiered licensure system, and so we have the now we have a third tier, which is an advanced professional license. And the goal of that was to make sure that teachers who wanted to go wanted to advance in their career did not have to leave the classroom, that they could actually stay in the classroom and become a teacher leader, and that the goal to further in yourself was not administration only. So we're really <coughs> pleased to have these standards and looking forward to having teachers um, in the coming years seek out that, that advanced professional level. Uh, so I'm going to turn this over to Flora, and she's going to walk you through the standards. Thank you. Good morning. Um, in 2008, the Teacher Leader Exploratory Consortium developed um, teacher leader model standards, and those were developed for states to start a discussion around teacher leader standards and what would be needed in a state to um, advance this. So today, this is the presentation of those standards for Michigan. Um, the purpose of the standards basically is to outline expectations for programs that are preparing teachers um, to receive or advance to that third tier, which is the Advanced Professional Education Certificate, or those who wish to serve as teacher leaders. Um, it recognizes the benefits of this third tier um, Advanced Professional Education Certificate is that it recognizes teacher effectiveness. It gives teachers an opportunity to function as leaders without giving up their classroom teaching. Um, it provides additional leadership support to the building administrator. And it also provides the opportunity um, for those teachers to um, do mentoring, coaching, and observation to other teachers in their building. And just as an overview, in 2012, a Michigan Department of Education um, cross-office team was formed to um, examine policies and practices impacting teacher leaders, draft a set of standards to guide preparation and indicate readiness for um, recommendation for that third tier licensure or certificate. <laughs> and the work group also examined teacher leader model standards that were developed by the Teacher Leadership Exploratory Consortium. They also looked at stakeholder input, um, looked at national expectations including national board certification requirements and other states' programs that were out there. Uh, a couple of the states that they looked at were Kansas, Illinois, and Louisiana in terms of how they had implemented those standards. And then some of the highlights of the standards, um, they reflect current professional needs, MDE and State Board of Education priorities um, in terms of technology initiative. We want to make sure that those teacher leaders know how to use technology appropriately. Um, that they are aware of and know how um, career and college readiness outcomes um, should be done, and the focus on individual learners in alignment to the Mayan task and the principal standards that we are now going through. And the standards are there are seven standards. Uh, one looks at school vision and mission, school culture, accessing and using research professional learning, improving <laughs> instruction, family and community, <coughs> and advocating for students and the profession. And these are really um, performance-based standards. We want to know, can these teachers demonstrate that they know how to act as teacher leaders? They are aware and really can um, conceptualize these various areas of the standards. And one example, and you do have in your package, you do have the standards that are attached. So you can um, take a look at those, and you'll see that each standard is accompanied by a set of substandards. But just as an example, we pointed out here um, standard three, which is accessing and using research. And that standard states teaches and supports colleagues to collect, analyze, and utilize data 
from their classrooms to improve teaching and learning. I think you just heard some of that from the previous um, presentation, which is we talk about data, we need to know how to use it, and these teachers can offer that support and assistance to other teachers as they um, learn their way through this and, and figure out how to appropriately use that data to improve their instruction. Um, and then these are the requirements for the third tier certificate. It is an optional certificate. Not all teachers have to advance to it, but those who do want to do that, they have to currently hold a professional education certificate. They have to have five consecutive effective or highly effective um, annual evaluations um, as required under law. And they have to hold national board certification or they have to have completed an approved teacher leader training or preparation program. So that is why um, we are bringing these standards to you because currently we don't have those, but once we get the standards in place, then we will be able to allow um, institutions or others to come in and apply to, um, to have those approved so they can offer these programs. And we are um, going to, after the board meeting today, we will send these standards out for review by the field and we'll give them until May, uh, roughly May 10th, which would be about a month to take a look at these. And then we'll come back to you in August and ask for approval of the standards. And if we have to do any revisions based on feedback from the field, we will do that. And we just will not have enough time to get this done by the June board meeting. So that is why we're coming back to you in August with these. And if you have anyone who needs more information, they can contact Leah Breen, who's the assistant director in the office. And that's her phone number. And Although we're here questions. for for you now, too, so yes, we are. Time, well, as, as you can imagine, I'm, I'm really happy to see these come into being um, because excellent teaching being the main driver of increased student achievement and outcomes, uh, things that we do, and this is a piece of it that provides positive career, have support, recognition, and uh, skill building, you know, are so needed, and, and I hope uh, will be helpful. Um, two quick questions. Uh, one, who actually then makes the uh, designation or that, uh, that awards the certifications at the department? It comes in those criteria? Yes, just like our, our certification mm -hmm. process, once the program is completed, then they will use our system to apply for that particular certificate and whoever the recommending institution is will go in and verify that the person has met all the requirements and then we'll, they'll get their certificate. And the second question, I assume it's, it's up to local district negotiation discretion to figure out if there's uh, pay or additional salary attached yes. to right. achieving these yeah, certifications. Right. Correct. We hope that there is that paradigm shift that will recognize um, teacher leaders in a way, in that way. Well, thank you very much for your work on this. John, to follow up on your point, I think that we would hope that people would see this as a way to think about pay. It's also a way that there's folks that may not want to for 30, they want to be a teacher for 30 years, but they may not want to be a teacher in exactly the same way. They might want to be a master teacher that a district would say, if you reach this level, uh, my daughter who has five preps a day, maybe you have three preps a day, and the other two you're, you, you're, you're mentoring younger teachers, things like that, that you've encouraged regularly. So, I mean, our hope is it stimulates that kind of thinking in the field, and I, probably to your point, when, we're, um, when we bring them back in August, maybe that's a time to offer what some of these suggestions might be. I mean, I guess we kind of just did, but there's others if you could put meat on the Richard, please, and then Kathleen. As, as I review these standards, they look very much like the master's degree that I took way back when I was teaching. And for the master's degree, I was given a bump in, uh, in, in salary. And <coughs> um, is this simply a standardization of a, of a program for I mean, you go into the, the master's I did 25 years ago, uh, or just an updating of this kind of thing? I it, it's not intended to be the equivalent of a master's degree. It's, it's intended to be more of the equivalent of the national board certification, which sometimes can take up to three years to actually complete. 
where teachers actually do uh, a rigorous self-assessment, they videotape their lessons, they critique them. So it's intended to be uh, more than a master's program. Uh, in fact, many of the teachers probably have already gone through and got a master's uh, just because of the way that the salary structure is driven. So a lot of teachers may already have a master's degree. And I don't know if this would be an example. I don't want to bias it because I don't know if they'd meet the standards. But as an example, um, a number of us many years ago started something called the Galileo Institute. Mm -hmm. And and they, it's teacher training in effect beyond uh, graduate work. And I would guess, I'm not, I don't, I'm not privy to this, but my guess is they would try to apply for this at some point and do they understand the standards, they'll probably get feedback. And it's, it's actually a consortium of a, of a couple of ISDs in Southeast Michigan and some local districts. And then um, I mean, when I was in Farmington, our teachers were kind of the first cohort. And it's, I think it was meant to say, well, this shouldn't just be for the national board certified because that's in place. Are there other kind of programs, that, for lack of a better word, that are portfolio based and uh, that could qualify? Yeah. I do think traditional, we had the deans, we had a meeting with the deans last week, and I think traditional, uh, they'll also look for opportunities beyond, let's say, a master's degree to say, here's an experience that you would have at Eastern Michigan and, co and con in partnership with maybe the MEA, maybe the, you know, this is trying to say all partners think about how you might fit into this. I had lunch with, uh, with Steve and Gretchen from the EA recently, and, and from my point of view, I think this is, a, this is an open door to, mm -hmm. you know, the profession itself saying, uh, do we want to partner with someone to put something together ourselves, meet the standards, and then, to John's point for a couple of years now, get to a point where you have a, another way to demonstrate something beyond, um, you know, to get that third tier. It's not really, it's not meant to lead to a master's degree. Uh, it's really, it's another way of demonstrating <coughs> a, a level of proficiency. And, you know, our hope would be that districts that have got the pay structures based on masters and learning of degrees would say that this is also a way of getting some of those pay increases is you don't have to have just a master's degree, but if you're a master teacher or the teacher leader, then there's also a way of, of, of seeking possibly some additional compensation. I'll bet low, I don't know, I don't want to put lowest on the spot, but I'll bet the FT already has issues through conferences and professional development that they have for teachers, and is there a way to package that and maybe look at these standards and say this would qualify then for a third tier? I was working on these standards when they were developed, so yes, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen, please, and then Eileen. Yes, that I, I want to follow up. That, that was a question I had, whether there were existing programs already that, that were geared to be teaching teacher leaders. There are some programs that are masters and, and for teacher leaders. They would not be based on these standards because we've not had these in place and they may not even meet all of these standards. They're not necessarily performance-based <coughs> types of programs. They may be just what you get in coursework and not necessarily can you really show us how you can use this, how it's applicable to what you do in the school. You know, can you demonstrate that? Mm -hmm. So, okay, when I was on a NASB task force, mm -hmm. a study group a couple of years ago, we had presentation from teacher ambassadors that were selected by the department, U.S. Department of Education mm -hmm. as being master teachers. And some of them were quite young and they, they, you know, they were, they were, but they were crackerjacks. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the standards were that they used. Do you, do you know anything about that teacher ambassador program that no. the U.S. Department of Ed? I'm not familiar with that. So I don't know how they would have gone. I wonder about what like kind of standards know. they used. I don't know if it was. I think a couple of them were national board certified, mm -hmm. but I don't think all of them were. And I don't know how they got to be. They volunteered. I mean, they wanted to be. Yeah, the National Board requires that they have at least three years of teaching experience prior to oh. um, enrolling for the National Board process. So even though they may look really young, they, they probably would have had at least the three years of three teaching years. experience. Okay. Kat, to your point, it might be existing that I think the network, Bobby Joe's part of the network, and they probably have experiences that can they 
-hmm. build on to say here's a package of experiences that we think would then qualify, okay. which might be similar to the ambassadors. <coughs> but this is say we, what we call teacher leaders, others call master teachers, right? Is that what you're, are they um, similar? The it, they could be similar, yeah. Not necessarily Ma the same. Not necessarily the same. I, I remember when we first started with mentoring and induction, we talked about master teachers and what they would be. And these would be people who had the years of experience, um, were probably more actively involved in their professional or content associations, were actively involved in professional learning at the building level, but not necessarily really trained as teacher leaders. But they you know they were able to mentor new teachers, coach new teachers, and some of these teacher leaders have been around in informal ways. Yes. You know more so than formalized. What we're doing now is really kind formalizing of formalizing them. this and really giving them the recognition as teacher leaders to serve in those roles that they've been kind of drafted into mm -hmm. and still have their classroom responsibilities and probably not with any more pay than what they have been getting. Yeah. Because some of those these teacher ambassadors were talking about teaching just three days a week, maybe, and and doing this master teacher kind of thing or teacher leader activities the other two days. Right. Um, yeah. Apparently, several of them did that. So. Right. I think Flora said that very well. It was Eileen and Michelle and Dan. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed the microphones. I miss. I know. I miss <laughs> with them and just having the work. <laughs> Here. A lot <laughs> I, I want to thank you, uh, Flora, for this, and, mm -hmm. and also Sally, that if everybody who's worked on this. This is stellar work, and in the time since I re-entered the board in the last two years, the discussions that we've had during, those, during that time period and before 2006 has always centered on how well can we translate what needs to be done in the schools back to the teacher preparation institutions. And I, I, I want to bring up the concept for this, also the school administrator and principal regulations for the, the standards that, you, that, that were uh, read or entered last month. Last month, yeah. Um, that I, I'm hoping, despite layering another huge amount of work on you, that there's a way to take these new standards and uh, go back to the teacher preparation institution standards and see whether we're really um, asking them to do what we're seeing the schools need just because we're thinking this through and we're strategizing. And I, uh, so the real question for me is when should teachers have their first exposure to these standards um, in teacher prep and how many of them? How many of these could actually be um, uh, uh, explored to some degree in teacher preparation and should be rather than waiting for a teacher to mature on the job? Is it fair to ask schools to do a significant amount of training for applicability of these kinds of standards? So for me, as I wander around to schools listening to what's going on, um, there I see continual new teacher criticism for lack of preparation in the use of data <coughs> for instructional improvement, um, uh, candidate knowledge of digital and blended learning models and uh, what that means when you walk in the door of a classroom. Although as digital natives, that should be an easier transition for them than it would have been for me. Um, modeling good classroom skills and not just lecturing on them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something I'm hearing a lot about, that, that kids are learning the content, or the, the knowledge that they need, <coughs> but when they walk into the classroom, they don't know how to uh, develop that persona as well as they should. And this deals with that. The, these standards on a, on a, on a, uh, uh, for this level of teaching really deals with what a person should be, their characteristics in the, in the classroom. And the last one is being able to use technology fluently in the classroom. Again, that's digital. These are digital mm -hmm. natives. You would mm -hmm. think that that's something that would come easily. So, I know I'm asking for more work, but well, maybe maybe we could take that idea and send it to the dean's list, sir, with a particular ask, a specific ask. Would they help us think through the alignment? Blah 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 blah. And maybe the two major associations, in particular, with uh, FT and EA, to say, can you help us? see that alignment. Well, and let me let me differentiate. The the, in, the the my in-test standards do pretty much what you what you just spelled out for new teachers. So that when they leave their teacher prep institution that they are really ready to teach. We're not asking them. I mean, they still have a learning curve, but they are really classroom ready. This is going above and beyond that in the sense that these are for teachers that they can't even apply unless they have the professional teacher certificate, which is going to take them into 
uh, and then they have to have five years of evaluation. So we're talking about teachers who've got a couple years under their belt before they really start to go to that next level. And I completely understand that. There aren't that many that I think should be uh, really dealt with well in ad schools, but the question I would have, and Lois is here so maybe she knows the answer, how are we able, I, I'm hearing this anecdotally, and, and Bobby Joe and I were talking about it briefly, you know, there's certainly the, the deer in the headlight uh, uh, situation of getting out of ed school and facing your first classroom and really mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to fit all those blocks of knowledge into a child's life. But the question is, uh, uh, is it really being done well enough so that, te so that we don't lose a number of teachers, we're losing so many as they first come out, and also recognizing that the teachers who are walking in the door right now started their teacher prep uh, two, two to three years ago. So, you know, we, mm -hmm. we've certainly been asking for changes mm -hmm. all the way through. Yeah. We may not be seeing the results yet. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to miss this opportunity as we look at the whole spectrum of what teachers, of what a, a great teacher should be able to do in the classroom, mm -hmm. of making sure that the, the ed school programs actually address that and, and uh, uh, create a teacher who's able to get to the spot. Uh, quicker and not get out of the profession. Yeah, and, and we are moving in that direction. I don't know if you saw last week the article about U of D Mercy and the collaboration with the Michigan Virtual University in the online learning and blended instruction. And I have gotten information from other institutions that are also um, doing those kinds of things. So they're all they're all moving in that direction and know that they have to. Um, they cannot afford to not do this. That, that specific one happens to be one, two summers ago, we, we, yes. we really pushed them on, frankly. Mm -hmm. and, and then some who didn't meet our timelines, we gave them a chance, and then they did to their credit. And I understand one of the institutions moved their, moved their dean on because they felt they weren't taking this seriously enough in terms of especially the technology piece. Because that is, a lot of that is the deer in the headlight argument. But I think what, to align with you and Sally are both saying, Eileen, I think there are pieces in that. That's the point. There are a few that Eileen just read that are. Well, and part of it is, just, is helping teachers, just like we've asked the teacher prep institutions as part of the uh, preparing teachers, they need to know what these new evaluation systems are going to look mm -hmm. like so that they walk in and they expect to be evaluated on these specific criteria. In the same way, we need to make sure they understand that here's how you get certified and here's the levels of certification. I don't think, I mean, I sure, no, I had no idea that those kinds of things existed and I think that's part of their responsibility is to say it is a normal part of your job to have an evaluation system. It's a normal part of your job to understand here's the certification and here's the requirements to move up. Um, so I, th I think that needs to be all part of the training. And I think that's just very complex to do, and I, I, I don't want to miss this opportunity to make sure they're informed. The only other comment I had, and again, I was picking Bobby Joe's brain, is that number seven um, has uh, a broad, I don't know very many master teachers who understand the political structure well enough to lobby. The, uh, within the standard, the elements that are there are actually less um, broad. So I, I just, I, it was pretty daunting to me to, to read that they needed to understand the political structure. And I don't know until you get to be teacher of the year whether you're really aware of it. Oh, no. I mean, even then, you know. Stay away from <laughs> politics. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I only wanted to point that out. It may be a little uh, global. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah I like that. Kathleen. I wanted to ask the Kathleen question whether Sorry. you said that someone has to recommend mm -hmm. these teachers to become certified teacher leaders. Who, who could recommend? It's, it's the process. It's what we call the recommendation process. Once you complete a program, the institution or whoever that provider is has to verify that you've actually met all of these standards and you're now ready to receive the certificate. So it could be a university. It could be a state education association that comes up with a program that meets the standards. They apply. If they meet the standards, we give them approval. And then, then people go through their program, and if they meet the criteria of the program, then they get recommended. Could it be the teacher's school district? Could be. Uh, in, in legislation, there's yeah. no limitation as far as yeah. who can yeah. consider I mean, a that, program. That, that's exactly right. That's why, as an example, <laughs> Galileo, which is really just a consortium of districts and ISDs, uh -huh. they may very well want to go this route so that they... Uh, but, but, 
<coughs> in a way, our challenge, I think, in August is going to help, is going to be to excite many different entities that have you thought about doing this and how it would create. I mean, for my own daughter, I recommended the regular, regular in the best sense, but traditional master's degree, get that. Mm -hmm. And then look when these things are built for other opportunities that are closer to kind of your, uh, not closer, but, you know, after you've had five or six years of experience that you try to tie it in with a Galileo or a board certified or something com mm -hmm. that comes out of the FT or Dan, I think, or Bobby Joe and then Dan, sorry. <laughs> I might be mixing this up. Oh, I, I was just hoping as well when we talk to these institutions about it that they take into account teachers that have been in these roles already that are looking to get that certificate and not having to start all over. Mm -hmm. Teachers that are already out there doing this. Yeah, yeah we're not. Yeah, we're not prescribing a set number of courses or oh, okay. saying you have to complete this many credits, but they have to show how are they meeting the standards. There could be some other assessment or some way of getting to that, not necessarily that they have to do coursework. Okay. But, but, uh, but that's a good point. We've got to figure out is there some how do you demonstrate that? Yeah. yeah. If you've been in that role, how mm -hmm. do you demonstrate that so you don't have to go back? Right. Yeah, it's a good point. That's why I was wondering if the school district could recommend and they have someone like Bobby Joe, for instance, who's got this experience, uh, we just certify her right away. Who we'll says she'd recommend, recommend that right away that she'd be a... Well, yeah, we'll have to think through a way to do that. I mean, in theory, we could have, there might be other problems with this, but in theory, you could have standards for teacher of the year that match with these standards. So almost by definition, if you're named right. teacher of the year, you're... They probably do pretty closely align yeah. in terms of the person's uh, uh, stature and issue. ability, but yeah, you know that might. All well, our teachers of the year, they've all been doing this. For mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they should be part of. The, they should put that in the in the thing. <laughs> the teachers of the year automatically qualifies. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, please, thank you. Um, <laughs> the runners up too. That's a, a great point, Mike. And we actually, I mean, I'd, I'd be happy for us to revisit the kind of criteria around, you know, nominees for Teacher of the Year to make sure that they aligned with these standards so that um, Teacher of the Year would automatically qualify. Um, three quick things. Uh, Bobby Joe took my fourth, which uh, just to echo it. Um, yeah, if you've been in this role for 15 years, it doesn't make any sense to now make you go back to complete some program. We've got to figure out how to those folks can be properly identified and, you know, grandfathered in, if you will, to this certificate level. Um, but three quick things. Um, one is when you come back in August, um, Dr. Jenkins, I would love to see a just a chart that lays out kind of tier one, here are the eligibility criteria, and we know that makes you a teacher. Tier two, <coughs> here are the eligibility, you have to do this to meet it, right? Um, or complete this kind of program. And generally speaking, kind of the comparable titles, if you will, in the, like, so once you have this, we might expect to see you fill this kind of role if there's, if there's a new or additional role. Okay. Tier three, eligibility criteria, and yeah, we would expect to see you as a dean of a, content area at your high school or an instructional coach or whatever the just comparable titles might be that we think align with kind of where we would expect to see teacher leaders, that would just that'd be helpful for me. Yeah. Sure. Idea. And I see you guys are you're no nodding problem. like this is already in the works. <laughs> yeah, so we, we, we probably We've already have it somewhere. For about a year and a half. So. <laughs> <laughs> we have many charts. We have many charts. <laughs> I just um, want to follow. Oh, oh sorry. Ahead. I just want to follow up with, with Dan because that was that was exactly what was on my mind. And I'm also wondering about using these um, uh, advanced uh, master teacher leaders to do evaluations, or somehow when we talk about um, having peer review mm -hmm. for the teacher evaluation process, mm -hmm. because I think it's an important to connect it not only to the prep programs but also to the evaluation program. That these would be good candidates, and if we could build that into the teacher evaluation program. And I think that's something that has to be negotiated at, at each local. But, but it could be um, recommended or maybe suggested. But I think at least doing some of the observations <laughs> is, is a key part of that. Yeah. Um, I think with now principals having to evaluate every single teacher, it makes sense to move into that role, but I think we're going to have to grow into that because that's a new role for teachers to be evaluating each other. So right. I think we've got a ways to grow into that, but I think it's, it's foreseeable in the future. Um, the two other really quick things were one is I just want to encourage us to um, 
want to be careful how I say this, but to like rigorously apply the standard. Um, want it to mean something to be a teacher leader. Uh, we've got fantastic educators who've been filling these roles, and um, you know, one of the kind of traps that awaits us with every time we do this kind of a thing is that um, ultimately the standard doesn't mean anything and everybody can become one. Um, and uh, that doesn't serve the purpose that we're really setting out to achieve here, which is to to allow folks who um, have achieved a really high level of mastery um, stay in this field and profession um, and give the gifts that they have, share those gifts with students and with other teachers. Um, so really want to encourage kind of rigorous application of the standards as we think about what programs might qualify um, to deliver uh, you know, this kind of certification at the end. And then lastly, just a quick shout out um, to uh, kind of um, jumping off of the point that Eileen was making about the deer in the headlights work and so on. I've, I've gone and I spent a little bit of time, not nearly enough, but a little bit of time uh, um, kind of with the rounds program, the grand rounds program at the University of Michigan School of Education. I know U of M Dearborn has a similar program and uh, just really fan, uh, just a huge fan of what those kinds of programs produce. A little less time maybe in the classroom and a little more time Kind of this is built on the medical school model, right, of a uh, student going like, mm -hmm. so you ultimately graduate kind of in a do no harm, right? <laughs> like you have actually right. practiced yeah. under the <laughs> watchful eye of an attending, so on and so forth. I mean, it's really great outcomes. And those yeah. kids in that program seem so much more confident, um, so much better prepared. And it's, it's you know, albeit a layman's eye, that I'm watching all of this with, but um, uh, really I think a wonderful development in the world of teacher prep institutions and would love to see it expand and grow. I know that's not the purview of you guys or of us, but I just wanted to take the opportunity to publicly say bravo on folks who are building those programs and um, uh, expand them, please. From a U of M grad, but <laughs> we... <laughs> <laughs> No, but that you're making an excellent point. You just, you just gave me a flashback. The first job I got in Michigan 22 years ago was at the Michigan Partnership for New Education where Dean Judy Lanier of MSU was yeah. trying to expand the medical school model, um, which makes a lot of sense. Um, I just wanted to, uh, back to Richard's point about isn't this just like a master's, and as you just said, Dan, I mean, one of the critiques, and I think Flora spoke to this, of our teacher career development system is that depending on the master's degree you get, it may or may not be tied very strongly to the skills competencies of being an excellent teacher or teacher leader. And the opportunity here is to do something uh, potentially more rigorous, more um, competency that you need to be an excellent teacher, teacher leader uh, than a master's you know, program necessarily provides. Um, some of them certainly do, but it, it doesn't guarantee it. And you know, th this is a real opportunity for folks to be the mentors of new teachers, to be the peer evaluators, to be the instructional team leaders in buildings. You know, that's what is so needed, and, and provide a kind of a, a license and a credentialing to encourage that. So, I think John, your your point also gets at traditionally you may have to become an assistant principal <laughs> to have part of your day allowing you to do that where the rest of the day you're doing milk carton duty or you're doing discipline and mm -hmm. this instead says no there's a stay within your in your uh, wheelhouse here and do it that way and then there's another thing to be an administrator that's to be respected too but that's <coughs> what we've done traditionally we've tried to mix these two skills when you might be real good at that stuff and just not at this and we just don't, didn't have a vehicle till now so this is exciting appreciate the board's leadership the past few years on this and the team has done a great job. So we're good till August. We'll be back and uh, we'll get public. I know that Lois is already scribbling some comments. I don't know if she's already developed them, so we're good. You're doing good. <laughs> so thank you. And uh, I guess the same team, huh? Yep. It's the partnership agreement between the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation. As we all know, it's called CAPE. <laughs> and the Michigan Department of Education. Go ahead, Sal. 
Well, we figured you didn't have enough acronyms between <laughs> in Kate and TX, so we created another Thank one, you. and then we didn't spell it in the way that you would think that it would be spelled based on how you pronounce it. So hopefully we have completely confused you. Um, but as Mike said, this uh, NCATE and, and TAC have now combined, so we don't have two competing accreditation institutions for the education prep institutions. Uh, and we will be, we're one of the lead states in moving forward with the agreement to make this go into effect as quickly as possible. So, Flora? Anything Thank you. Um, the agreement, we've had agreements with both of the national accreditation associations, both TAC and NCATE. And so that's one of the criteria that you have to have in place for national accreditation of your institution. And so we are now requiring that all of our educator preparation institutions be nationally accredited by um, December 31st of this year. And so um, one of the things that we have to do is get the partnership agreement in place so that they know that we as a state actually have approved the program in um, that they are ready to go through the process of national accreditation. And since this is a new organization, we need to do this new partnership agreement. And what you will see is in the agreement, they refer to educator preparation providers, and we call our institutions that educator preparation institutions. So there's a little bit of a, a difference between their acronym and our acronym, but um, it's pretty much the, the same. And so you will, you will see the various sections of the agreement um, the standards for national accreditation of educator preparation providers, the process that they outline for educator preparation providers or EPIs as we refer to them. These are all outlined here. They have to submit um, a self-study to CAPE and, and they have to follow the approved format for the CAPE agreement. Um, all of the terms, everything here is based on on them providing information that shows that they are meeting certain outcomes and certain claims that they've made about their programs. Are they really living up to that? Can their teachers really do all of these things that they make claims about? And so they still have to submit their inquiry brief. Um, there's a lot of information and data that they're going to have to submit. And they will have to build reports um, between accreditation visits. So each year they're going to do an annual report. Each year they're going to be reporting data to us through that performance um, report that we have them do. And so all of this is going to help them to be prepared for the next accreditation um, review. And it's going to show that we as a state are doing what we need to be doing to make sure that our institutions are providing the kind of programs that they say they're providing. Um, also, you'll see in there a term that's called um, is specialized professional area program reviews, and these are what they call SPAs. These are national associations, content associations, and they will have to go through and get their programs, their content programs approved by these national SPAs if there are some, if there is a SPA for that particular program. One or two of them would be the NSTA, National Science Teacher Association, and the standards that they set. Um, for science and whether or not they've gotten the programs reviewed by them. And, and the National Mathematics Council for teachers, NCTM. So, and then there's social studies, so and so on down the line. But anyway, all of these are elements that are included in this agreement. So we are bringing this to you. We would like to get um, your approval and endorsement or whatever to move forward with this. As Mike says, we are one of the pilot states for this new agreement. Um, I think Ohio is the other state that is going through um, the pilot with them. And Thomas Bell, um, who you've seen at the table before, is one of the staff members who's very critical in um, getting this agreement put together. When they do do the national accreditation visit, there's always a staff member, an MDE staff member from the office that is assigned to work with the institution and work with the CAPE representatives on that. Um, visit to make sure that if there are any clarifying questions that they have about the state process, those can get answered during that visit. And if I may just say, the reason we used endorsement is the technicality is the state mm -hmm. soup has to approve this, but I'm not going to sign it if you're not comfortable with it. <laughs> so that's why we would bring it back in May. <laughs> yeah. Cassandra. Um, 
The fact that it's coming back in May, uh, I, I just have to ask the question, <coughs> is the timeline realistic? Because we know that uh, accreditation is a long process, mm -hmm. and based on the logistics and expenses in here, it says six months before the on-site review, um, the EPP must establish a call for comment. If we're approving <coughs> this in May, that means they have to do that in June. <coughs> so, I mean, I, I just think the time, I'm just curious if this is realistic. They, the institutions have already been going through the process. Okay. And NK are doing this. They've <laughs> either been doing NK or TAC already. So a lot of this has already been done. But because this new association, the joint association is coming together, we now need this new state agreement. So, and I don't know if Thomas can make any further clarification well, I think on this. Some of the institutions got their accreditation earlier than the others. Yeah. So when they are ready to, to renew that, they'll follow this process. Mm -hmm. We've got one or two that I think are just okay. about ready to they're finish good. up they right don't now. Have to, if they're already currently accredited, they, they don't have to start this no. immediately. No, they're not. They're going to, they'll have their next visit will be through this agreement. Yeah. Okay, because that was going to be my next question about the cost. If they've already paid for accreditation once, yeah. are we yeah. making them pay for it? No, they're good until their next visit, which <coughs> whatever their next visit is, they're going to go through using this process. Okay. This is really, in some ways, a technicality to accommodate <coughs> the consolidation or the right. partnership between these two who used to be competing um, accreditation, accreditation folks. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's a good clarifier. Okay. Uh, and I don't even want to say technicality. There's pieces in there I think we want to make sure everyone's mm -hmm. comfortable with. Eileen was next, and um, here I am leaning for my microphone again. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I just I wanted to find out if you could just briefly describe uh, what the three pathways are: the continuous improvement, inquiry brief, or trans transformational initiative. Do they have to do with the um, uh, length of the program has been in operation? Are they? Um, are, do they address um, uh, concerns about the program, I, or, or is it just simply uh, what suits the institution best? I'm going to ask Thomas Bell to come to the table because he's been trained in all of these and he knows them very well. Thomas? Thomas Just did a sure session last week with the institutions on all of this. So you're ready, right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> that was the right answer. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me uh, the moment to answer your question. Um, the continuous improvement pathway is the traditional NCATE pathway, uh, which uses um, a self-study that aligns directly to the standards. And so the institution will develop a narrative and then provide evidence and exhibits that show a direct alignment to that standard. And they need to show continuous improvement as they go out, um, go through the process. The inquiry brief path pathway is the traditional TIAC process where the institution will develop claim statements. And they align the claim statements to the standards and then they show evidence and then they show the data. So it's a little different. Um, there's still some negotiation as to which process they're actually going to use to review because TIAC has used an audit historically, whereas NCATE has used a critical examination of judgment. Um, and then the transformational initiative is new, and that's kind of a hybrid of both. And it's for institutions that are doing things that are uh, revolutionary in education, that have kind of flipped things on their head. And what they're saying is, we've done research and we're using a research initiative, and we might fail. But this is what we're doing, and this is what we've done the last five years in our, since our last accreditation. Um, help us figure it out. So U of, U of M's um, yeah. medical school type program might be eligible. I've, I've spoken with a few of their folks about maybe doing the transformational initiative. They might not do it this time, but 2023 when they go through next time, they might do it. So um, it just depends on uh, where they're at with that particular Great, point. thank you. When you say 2023, is it literally that, or are you just picking a number? Hypothetically, an accreditation could span up to seven years. So, and that's why we have the year metric annual reports that they provide, and as also, as a state process, we have certain things that we look for. So, so we're talking 10 years from now already. Yeah. Well, in some cases, in some some cases, cases. Wow. it might be. Oh. It's daunting to think about for me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be 40. Oh. 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 That's the first time I heard a moan at the state board table. <laughs> that beer does be work. So I didn't realize you were quite, quite that young. They're just babies down there. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah, right. I'm with it. 
other board? We're good. <laughs> yeah. We'll bring it back next month. Thank, okay. you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion in item D regarding the criteria for grant program is a singular one. Okay. We want to go through some minutes and stuff and work through part of that. Yeah. Let's do that. So, um, good morning still, but the time is now 11.28 and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of April 9 is called to order. First item is the approval of the State Board of Education minutes, uh, regular and committee of the whole on March 12th. So moved. moved by Eileen. Support. Supported by John. Any corrections, discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Next is approval of minutes of the closed session of March 12, 2013. So moved. By Lupe. Supported Support. by Dan. Any corrections, discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Thank you. We'll come back. Well, we could, if someone happens to be here for public participation, we could do that and then we'll bring it back for sure in case some folks aren't coming till one. But we wouldn't want to hold someone up if they happen to have it. Okay, so we'll have this back on the agenda at the, after lunch as we typically do. Superintendent Flanagan. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can I take a personal point of personal service yes, and introduce my guest? Yes, ma'am, absolutely. I want to introduce uh, Maggie Magdalena, Maggie Rivera. She's a school board member in Holland, Michigan. Oh. Oh, the welcome. First Latina ever elected. Oh, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. We're probably going to wait on the new employees because I think they're set to come in, in the afternoon. So we could jump to John if you'd like. We could jump to your report. Sure. Or we could go. Okay. Um, just, uh, very briefly, one, I was given the discussions that are going on in the legislature around the uh, proposed changes to the Michigan Merit Curriculum and Common Core, um, it was, it's too bad we didn't get um, the folks from Stockbridge with their CTE programs and Paul Galbinski, our Teacher of the Year, and what Oakland County is doing because you know, we do need to continue to try to illustrate um, that it is very uh, not only doable but important to do, particularly around the career technical programs. Uh, to successfully integrate the uh, language arts and mathematics that even make those, uh, what Paul called, me, uh, called he, he pigeonholed me at that Education Summit meeting, Dan, that mm -hmm. Dan spoke at, very concerned that you know, when we as a nation, and Arnie Duncan has said it need to build Career Technical 2.0, which includes um, programs that uh, really layer and integrate credentials and competencies leading to post-secondary technical training, uh, which is what they're doing in Oakland. And Paul was even sharing examples of how you know, they've successfully, and some of us who were there saw it, embedded our language arts and mathematics quite fully in a range of career technical programs, which then the programs themselves are much more high-end in their destination points for young people. They aren't delimiting you for some narrow occupation. They're letting you build in the medical field or the IT field as far as you can go uh, or jump off when you're an, you know, an HVAC repair person, electrician, or a journeyman apprentice. So, um, and the, the public reporting on Stockbridge that was done uh, on their program, similarly, they just said, no, we are preparing career technical, we have career technical programs that in all our fields that integrate the academic uh, rigor that's needed to do to work in these professions. So I think that discussion, and we heard about it at the Macomb Forum in particular, a lot of testifiers concerned about we're killing career tech with our Michigan merit. We need to help illustrate and, and help us all see, and Paul was giving good examples of just folks not yet believing they can do it or seeing how to do it, uh, and, and so we need to continue that dialogue. Um, and I'm a, I'm, there was, there's been some good coverage of the language arts or the uh, foreign language um, uh, merits uh, of that uh, in, in the press and the importance of exposure to foreign language and the fact that it can be done at any time in our kids' careers, I hope, is compelling. So I just hope we as a board, working with the department, will do everything we can to try to constructively illustrate and encourage uh, continued uh, uh, support for the complex of skills, both career technical and uh, the, the, the content that needs to inform that, uh, that we need in Michigan. Um, we do have um, 
we do have, uh, I guess, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven more forums that are on deck. Uh, and I, again, I think these have been and are very useful uh, opportunities for us to share perspective, including on issues like the Michigan Merit Curriculum, uh, share perspective on ideas uh, it, that are in legislation now or that were potentially proposed on school finance and choice, but also engage the public. And so um, I think with just a little more detail on, on I know, Grand Rapids uh, uh, event, we have Thursday, April 18th in Detroit that Kathy's arranged at 4 to 7, hosted by Michigan State University College Ex Education Extension. Wednesday the 24th in Traverse City from 5.30 to 7.30. Is anyone able to go to Traverse City on Wednesday the 24th? Uh, the League of Women Voters are the organizer of that. Let, let us anyone know. Going? Is there no, there's no I, I, I promise to go uh, in my uh, lunacy to uh, accommodate <laughs> requests, but I'm eager to have anybody else who can go join me. What is this start? 5.30. How long does it take to get there? <laughs> Quite a while. Three hours from here. Five hours to get there. Four hours from where you are. Oh, I have a meeting until three. So oh, think about it. Let me, let me, yeah. okay. I'll get there right into the I might be I able teach to a class until four. two in Ann Arbor, and it would take I'm about four oh, hours, okay. so I could get to about six. If, if you are, I mean, I, I do, and we all want to facilitate diverse board representation. So if it's at all possible, I, it would be useful, certainly, for them and for us. Well, I might, I, I just need I to understand. juggle some things. Right. And if I go, I would Kathy says she okay. can as well. All right. Um, Monday the 29th of April in Port Huron, 6 to 8. Marquette, there's a road trip to Marquette, to May 6th for the UP. Thursday, May 9th in Grand Rapids from 3 to 6. Monday, May 13th from 6 to 8, Western Wayne and Oakland counties at Novi. Uh, and Okemos for Lansing area Thursday, May 16th. And I think that is all that we can do, And but it's nice that people are eager to facilitate them. So I think with additional detail, we'll get this um, made public and, again, encourage any and all board members to participate. Um, last thing I had, I just wanted to uh, raise it now or later. Lupe asked a question. and. A conference that she's interested in attending. Now, and we haven't probably talked about our conference attending policies. We've been facilitating board members going to education policy conferences, particularly those that are NASB or other sponsored. Um, this is the um, Latino Elected Officials National Conference. Um, so I flagged it um, based on uh, Lupe's request because it, it was labeled their uh, political conference of elected officials. It is a bipartisan elected officials conference, but I didn't want, I, mean, I think our general policy should be we don't, uh, uh, we don't support us or pay for attendance at our Democratic or Republican political events, but I wanted to just ask this on Lupe's behalf, uh, whether this was the kind of event that the board was comfortable with uh, uh, having, supporting her in attending in the national bipartisan elected official Latino conference. So it may not be a straightforward answer, but I wanted to at least raise it uh, with everybody. What kind of budget do we have? That's a good question. Well, as we speak, <laughs> we hope they haven't <laughs> taken it. I mean, they're, they're somewhat on a serious note. They're, they're, I, I, I mean, there is some talk about paring down the department's budget, including your line items and particularly mine and yours. Um, but you know, let's just let's presume that people will do the right thing, and that's not going to happen, and we're going to have an appropriate allocation. Um, we normally can fit pretty much all requests within that line item, if I'm not mistaken, the board has. The difference may be this year, the forums. If, you know, you, you know. The difference this year from previous years may be the forums and the additional travel. So are we near, do you know, we may have to get back to you to know with whether we're within we're striking range of by estimates, we'd be close. We'd be close with or without? To, the, to, <laughs> so you to the limit. I can get a more detailed estimate. And I don't know that, so if we went over a little bit, is that, yeah, that is a problem, especially <laughs> with the issues that, well, why don't we, we get a, you that? Did we have sort of an, an agreement or an understanding that um, everybody could go to one conference a year? Um, 
Oh, the yeah, I, I, so we haven't yeah. talked about that in a yeah. long time. Right, like um, I think sometimes people went to ECS or NAS and uh, N S B A. You know, other organizations yeah. just that just yes, but, but I think we had sort of an unwritten understanding. And maybe I think it was unwritten uh, that we pick one other conference. And it's, I think it's great that we finally have a Latino on the board, a Latina on the board. Yeah. Again, it's been a long time. Yeah. So it would be good to have what? Yes, ma'am. Well, you know, know I, I asked uh, Naleo about the political conference, and it is not a political conference like you all think. Or we're going to talk about the Democrats or the Republicans or any other group. There's a big chunk of the uh, sessions that are dedicated to education. This is the agenda of the Hispanic community nationally. You, if you all, any of you go with me to this conference, you will want to go next year and the next year and the next year because these conferences are very well planned. In fact, Michigan is a host state because it's going to be in Chicago. Uh, and so we're a host state, so we're uh, helping them put this conference together. We have another meeting in Chicago, and, and it's national-wide. People from all the country come and help plan for this conference. So not only am I, whether you approve it or not, I'm going to attend the conference because this is a great way for me to know more about the Latino agenda in the national level that I could in turn will bring to the board and to the Michigan uh, Department of Education. Yes, you have a Latina on this group mm -hmm. and we are going to talk more about the Latinos agenda and education being the priority. So I am urging you to look very carefully at, to my request because this conference is going to make not only myself a better board member, but it's going to bring information for you and the department to be better knowledgeable about not only education in, in one scope, but extending it to the Latino group. This group is absolutely excellent. Dan, please. Um, I, so, I had can't recall now how long I've been here, but I don't actually ever remember us having a conversation in my term, term uh, about this subject. So um, to my knowledge, there's no policy. Um, if there is one, it's, it predated my arrival here. Yeah. I would propose, um, I, I have no idea what kind of budget line item we're talking about, and that might be a useful background or context to have, but it, it seems logical to me that whatever that line item is, that it just be split equally between the members of the board, if you will, and you, I mean, you should be able to go to the conference that um, you know you feel like advances your work or knowledge or understanding of this work, whatever it is, um, uh, you know, and, and when you hit your cap based on the equal division of that that budget line item, then you're on your own. The, the challenge I, I, I know in uh, in just executing that has been um, we had people like Liz Bauer who were fantastically busy visiting schools and being active and probably had higher expenses submitted than other board members who were um, less active. Uh, so there, you know, that, that may or may not be inappropriate. Um, those who are doing their job and spending time, it might be okay. So, but I think we probably should, A, just revisit the policy um, or see if we have one and, and if sure we don't, we one perhaps make I one. I remember we discussed it, but right. that was before you were on the board, I think, Dan. But also, I guess, as we do that, um, if we can, uh, if we can, if we think we can afford it within the line item, and if, in the general spirit of uh, uh, people can attend a conference that's important to them, would we uh, object to um, Lupe's? Does anyone object to Lupe's attending this conference? Should those two conditions be met as we revisit the uh, the a larger picture of what's our policy here? I would have no objection, and given her um, desire to go and feel, you know, sense that it would advance her ability to perform the duties in which that, that she's expected to perform here at the table, I would support her going. Assuming we have the budget, I would agree. I would also add, um, I'm ha so I, I think that 
so were we to split that budget line item equally, I think my, you know, accompanying request would be that we all be flexible, and if I'm doing a lot less traveling to the various forums and actually don't need all of my budget, that I happily kind of give it over to others who are doing that work. You have a cap-and-trade system. There we go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> budget credit. And maybe Carol can, by the end of the day, give us a sense of where we are on that. I know there might be some that are outstanding, uh, and, and we need to estimate a little bit probably on the, on the uh, forum issue that you mentioned, give some estimate to that. The only reason I think you're appropriately a little more sensitive this year is because of some of that other dialogue we've been hearing from approaches. But, um, but short of that, I think, yeah, it, you know, just a trick of the trade that you may use, I very rarely don't get um, either a scholarship or say, can you pick up the expenses? Karen's very good at this. She does it in a very, and a lot of them don't offer it. But when you push back and say, I really would like to attend, I mean, I very rarely have a state expense. I mean, this one, partly they wanted me to attend. Um, I was there for, coincidentally, for my niece's wedding in Boston, and it was the next day. So, but I, but by gently pushing back, they just said, no, we need you there. And so I, I just, sometimes that happens more than you know, but you have to ask. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then sometimes it's not a quick answer, but they say we have scholarships you can apply for. And, um, but that's just to help keep it within. So you might be able to do more than you think you could do with that, with that, that ask. That would be one thing. Eileen, please. Um, the other thing that I've been doing, uh, for example, on April 24th, uh, the Atlantic Monthly is having its technology conference in Washington, and I went to that last year, and it was spectacular. It was the use of technology in the classroom and what, how, what, what kinds of things are being envisioned and developed by people that we're not seeing yet. But they also do it as a webinar. And so, uh, you know, this year, uh, just because of the things that are going on, I may participate that way. More and more of these conferences, you miss the networking, but you can get the um, materials that are being presented and, a comp and an understanding of what is um, what, what new things we need to be learning about that way. Uh, it's been pretty helpful. With Latinos, the networking is a most important part. <laughs> I saw that. I saw that the food, though. The food, the food is pretty yeah. darn good, too. <laughs> I saw that in your in your installation. Well, the, the networking is all these conferences, and you learn exactly. more from your colleagues yeah. from other states. Yeah. Than just and yeah. if you can't go, it's the next best thing. The next yeah, best thing, yeah. right? Would you would you? Well, agenda planning maybe you could think about where to more formally place this for future, you know, updates on either develop a policy or amend a policy or something like that, mm -hmm. and then you decide where we want to do that. So we'll we'll put on agenda planning where the agenda planning group would like to do this probably the next meeting or something. But in the meantime, we're going to try to find out by the end of the day. And, um, and, and I think I heard the board consensus that assuming there's uh, room in that, in that budget item that uh, everyone's comfortable. I think it is good to have finally a representative that can uh, attend to that, so that would be good. Okay. Policy, I appreciate you're getting that on the table yourselves because I do think we're uncomfortable if we don't have something we can point to and, and have clarity about it, and that would, that would that's much appreciated. Might as well run through mine, right? I, I don't have to even, I can actually do the whole thing today, I think. Normally I <laughs> zap it down. Um, one thing, I think they're bringing a board in here. I wanted to just show you because I think it might e be easier to visualize that for not because he's not worth a million dollars here, but for very little investment on the for very little investment, uh, but for the right reason by the same token, we're, we're able to move really to a fourth deputy. And that's because you think about where this was, and I don't take offense to this, you guys, because I'm not. You look at Carol and Susan, it's just not relevant to this discussion yet. They have their own kind of silos. Uh, they're relevant in every other way. <laughs> but what happened is the good news is the bad news. We got, you know, I, I frankly pitched hard with Governor Granholm and pitched hard with Governor Snyder when it came to Great Start that we would have that, that it wouldn't be at DHS and felt that he uh, you know, with us on that, we're, we're still transitioning some of community health over at some point that has aspects. Um, but in this particular area where Sally was, so we didn't have that whole bureau, if you remember. The executive orders of Angler took that away. It's 
so-called meat at the time. It was more broadly said. Uh, we didn't have CTE. Um, we lost the libraries. Um, seems like there's a fourth one in there. But what happened is, you know, just as is like organizational controls, span of control 101, that this just got unruly. Um, Sally was uh, genuinely good enough to deal with that, and we kind of in the back of our heads said at some point in time when we're able to transition, we would. So Joseph, who we is a bureau chief, so it's in that sense it's not like a typical director. Patty Cantu and CTV is a director. <coughs> so the bureau chief, in Joseph's case, has four, I think it is, directors. And they would be, just to give names so for folks who come to the table once in a while. Uh, David Judd, for uh, Vince Dean, Marilyn Roberts, and Vanessa Kiesler. Vanessa Kiesler. So they've, they've reported, unlike other directors, not to a deputy, they've reported to a bureau chief, who in turn reported to a deputy. And then it, so the span of control just grew over the last few years. We're happy overall that it grew. Uh, but it, it created this condition. So we kind of thought this through and realized, uh, as I said, Joseph's compensation would be bumped a bit because of the deputy difference. But we're able to then, within our budget, still figure out a way that this would be the fourth deputy. And it would, it would include, in order to accommodate the, the span of control issues, it would include not only the four that he has, but would include Office of Professional uh, OPPS. And part of the reasoning I wanted to speak to for a moment when we discussed it and some of the some of the natural connections there. And we have we have some natural connections there in terms of the um, assessment that is done in OPPS, the uh, e the education preparation institution accountability that is done scoring, the accountability scoring. Um, there there are a lot of things that, that are similar, uh, some of the specific systems that they have. Um, are similar to the systems that, that we've developed and so on. Right. And let me just add, this may not be everything that's in Flora's, in Flora's um, span of control now, because here's the piece that we've left open. I, I was flying back yesterday, and I don't know how, how much of that discussion got done. But we said to a larger team yesterday in forums, and, and still to continue for a while, that that doesn't mean what we're, we're, what we're not accommodating with this simplicity is maybe there are pieces within CTE. Maybe there are pieces within OPPS. Maybe there are pieces in within what Joseph already has in these four that actually that sub-piece should be over in a different area. And I don't want to prejudge this. I haven't even seen it yet, but we got our directors and others involved in that and managers to say, so, because it's, it's not yeah. likely that with the evolution of, let's say, career tech, to John's earlier point, which, by the way, we are, we either have or are getting that rescheduled. We, they just couldn't accommodate the date today for for Stockbridge and for. Uh, well, that's a yes. So you know that's the work we're going to still try to complete in the next week or so because I think there's a very good likelihood that these are um, stale is not the right word, but just because it seems to be appropriately within one division, there might be a career tech aspect now that we have these four divisions that that particular subset of CTE should be reporting somewhere else. So the, the thing we're giving, if you want to think about it that way, to others in the organization is to, is to make those decisions and to try to, to try to flatten this out. The problem with silos is you know, we've all struggled with this for years. Silos infer silos. And you have to work hard at how do you have cross-department uh, cross, um, work. So if you say something like Dev's leadership and you have a specific project on the board goal of, of focusing on uh, the African-American male, that ended up becoming very much this. But it was, it was tactical and it was specific. So folks from across the board were brought in here. And, and just for the sake of discussion, what, what might be one that a year ago we would have thought was unlikely, but added a lot of value to having that cross-representation to have something? Professional learning, when we did that on the South. Yeah, professional <coughs> learning. We did that cross-office because everybody had a role with that. You know, with career and college already standards, everybody in the department ended up having a role. So we've had a number, but that it, 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 
but it doesn't take care of like the day-to-day -day piece where why am I not more comfortable walking across three partitions maybe to get some conversation going with someone else. So I'm hoping what we're going to see when we debrief on this is, is, is that, that work yesterday is very helpful so that it becomes, it, you have to have silos partly because of civil service and everything else. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a thing here that we were frustrated with for two weeks as we were trying to think this through because on the one hand, you can envision what you'd like to do and if this was our company and you were the board of the directors and I was the CEO, we would just do it. And then there's then there's state government. Well intentioned, has lots of structure to it for some cases for past abuses, frankly, that haven't been undone yet. So but this is our general plan and the reason I wanted to just mention it is <coughs> first of all, I think uh, Joseph as you can see from our work the last few years, it's an important division on its own right. It, it, it's, it's a cheap way to do the right thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's manageable within that because of the, the difference and the, the, the reduce of the span of five here, five here. It's five and five when you think about broad <coughs> And within that, there may be someone help me with a piece of the, or maybe we shouldn't, but what might be an example of a piece of the department that typically has been within. CTE or something else that might be thought of in a different. Carol, in your area. Curriculum, yeah. yeah. curriculum um, in CTE and assessment, there's some of that in CTE, so I think we're looking at all of that. But we were not, the deputies were not privy to yesterday. Yeah. The, the reason we did that, and they're probably not happy with me, but it was <laughs> it's because, not because of them, they're very open minded, but if the perception is that we can't talk freely, even though they actually could. So I wasn't there and the four weren't there so people could be open about this, but it's just a perception issue to some degree. And one that comes to mind is we, we have help as a part of Kyle's that might actually, there's a subcomponent of that that maybe should be over here. But right now it's in Carol's position. So it could be a piece of it because of health and the connection that we have, health and nutrition to learning, that we may say, hey, it's beyond just in the best sense beyond just grant making and therefore does that make sense we might conversely say if charters are now in Sally's area and I don't want to again I don't know what came up yesterday but and if and we really this is a little bit troubling to me that that I'm charged with signing things that infer I approve of something when in fact it's perfunctory and it got tested years ago that that we were kind of regulatory when it comes to charters so if it's regulatory and not really looking at their academic benefit, and, and I don't mean that one way or the other as if it's good or bad, but if it's regulatory, maybe it's more regulatory in the sense that a lot of Carol's work is regulatory. You know, where as long as they're meeting the criteria, we'd sign it. And then they're, they're to, to some of the questions earlier, then they're obviously public schools like everyone else and they're on top to bottom list. But if, and, and when it first got put in there probably years ago, it was thought, oh, well, you need it in the academic area because that's where people are going to look at the academic aspects of the program. But we really have nothing to say about that. So I mean, those are the examples we're struggling with. The only decision made so far was kind of like, let's, let's change that span of control to five and five so that you're not overwhelmed in one division and uh, it kind of flattens everything a bit. Thought I'd bring you up to date on that. Any questions? Or and should we congratulate Joseph? Is that yes. in order? Yes. Yeah, that's a good. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody, I, and I guess I just wanted to note. I mean, from my point of view, uh, as superintendent, uh, you know, your opportunity, responsibility, and we trust your judgment to reorganize and organize and manage your staff as you think will work best. And so, um, we'll never be second guessing any of the organizational thing changes. But appreciate the explication too. The explanation. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. Um, CCSSO, uh, I don't, we may not have the picture ready because I, I, and this was, to me, I thought, first of all, those of you who in the forums help people understand career tech and language, this was yesterday morning. By the way, people work early here. I, I mean, it's like be there at, we were at a hotel in downtown Boston and then get to Harvard by 6.30. I mean, I'm not like a 6 So this is like 6.30. I was the guy dozing behind, taking a picture dozing. But this is the vice minister of all of education in China, which, of course, is a 
given their size. And then they had matching, this was the board of CCSSO, so my counterparts who are on the board, um, I think all but one of us were able to make it. And then they had province, uh, drawing a blank on directors, I think, who in effect are state superintendents or commissioners for, for large provinces. But I, I, I kind of left with a sense that we're doing fine. I, I think, I mean, I admire the work that China is, but it's, it, it's, it's kind of like sometimes we get all worked up that they're rushing ahead on education and everything. I've never done a visit, so I don't want to, this was for me partially a way to to not have to do the long trip back and forth that Michigan State and others have invited me at times, and I just haven't done it. But I really got a good flavor in two days that we're headed in the right direction in what we're trying to do, as are they. But it's not as if suddenly we're behind in this big race. I mean, we are with certain, if you look at certain, you know, Singapore and Finland, and they've made some strides that we should try to try to emulate, to say the least. But um, I felt good about that and appreciated um, the experience. Um, so I was ready to say, by the way, with the, with the language, it just struck me, it's embarrassing. So many of them spoke English, of course, and none of us, none of us there, including myself, none of us spoke uh, Chinese. Well, by the end of my term, all of you will be bilingual. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already, yeah. <laughs> and I think it's great to hear that at the forums there's opportunities to help people think through and understand the career tech sequence because what, what I find is if it is being done in 15 of 15 that I can identify then you can't say it can't be done it might be hard to get it done but by definition <laughs> and if it is being if, if language is being taught in elementary and middle before it competes with credits at the high school level and that's being done all over the place then it doesn't mean it can't be done. It may, it may be difficult to have it done. So it's very appreciated that you're helping sort that out regionally and, and testifying when appropriate, so thank you for that. A pretty interesting, uh, you know, now that the library's back, we're a little more involved in this, but they have a night for notables every year, and it's, uh, you have invitations, I think, in front of you. Um, and it's, the reason it's interesting, whether you like this guy or not, he's interesting, from my point of view, he's interesting, and, and uh, Nancy and Carol and the board there, we're on the board, uh, got Michael Moore to be the featured speaker, so that will be perhaps an interesting night. It's on April 27th. I think you don't have to go to all or nothing. There is a, I wrote a personal check the other day, it's kind of required because the foundation gets the, uh, gets the uh, benefits of that. And it's from 5.30 to 8.30, but you can go to part of it, all of it. Uh, I, think, I think Moore is on about there's a, v, there's a quote VIP reception for those that have paid a certain amount at right, some there's point. A, there's a $50 charge if you want to come to the evening and there's, there's beverages um, <laughs> and, and heavy hors d'oeuvres and you get to meet all of the authors. There's an opportunity for you to purchase their books if you choose, uh, talk with them, have them sign your books, etc. The more costly part of the evening is if you're actually at the VIP reception at 4.30 and then you're in the actual auditorium at the library with Michael Moore in person. If you, if you do the less costly, um, then you're out and about and you're actually seeing him in a video and while you're still enjoying beverages and orders. And this may be one, by the way, that fits in policy discussion about what's, you know, in some ways you'd be representing a, a, a function perhaps also. So I think those are appropriate things to think about when you. And then finally, uh, I think you saw yesterday with Marty's release, we were happy to get the ESAEA flex waiver. I was in the airport and I got a call from Arnie and, and literally I, I well, actually, I had it plugged in at one of the like three plugs in the whole place. So it's over here, I'm not hearing it. Finally see uh, my iPad and know Duncan's trying to, um, and ran over, grabbed my phone from I can't believe they haven't updated these enough to get some places where you can plug in <laughs> phones and stuff. And um, but it was it was more just it, congratulations on waiver and stuff. And I think he uh, potentially thinking of a visit, although he didn't go into detail with me on that yet. And if we know, we'll, we'll certainly share that. But I think this I want to just cite the team here because I know it, this was to do it again. Um, and I want to I want to commend the associations who really got it right the second time. 
so I won't obsess over not getting it right the first time and then blaming us. I'll say it, but I won't obsess about it. And then the second time, <laughs> the second time reconvening, I think we really did get a lot of these metrics right, and the, you know we've got a broader group. Some of the outliers where there probably were some issues, you know, may have been thoughtfully dealt with with this metric. And I felt comfortable that he, I'm sure he didn't look at it individually, but that he was comfortable with it based on folks he works with. So that was like a, a bonus. Um, <coughs> that concludes <coughs> your uh, yes, sir. Chinese vice chancellor. Um, reminded me of interesting <coughs> feature of Chinese bureaucracy, which they've had big bureaucracies for millennium, is that, which I first learned from Ken Lieberthal, Eileen probably knows, he was a Chinese <coughs> scholar. He, I had him at Swarthmore at U of M for many years recently, and it was just confirmed by this Chinese visitor I met. So the, if you were the superintendent or if you're a, a bureaucratic head in China, you have a chop, a seal, and that's what you, you know, stamp your papers with. Uh, whoever steals the chop is the, super, is the superintendent because, <laughs> you know, stealing the chop is, was rampant throughout history because that, that's the power of the office is represented by that seal. Oh so, um, you know, and whoever has it has the authority. Um, so I used to say, like, when uh, Mark Murray was treasurer, but he was Angler's uh, <laughs> education guy, I said, you know, Mark has Angler's chop for education. And it's true, you know, whoever has that authority that. has that job. So, <laughs> uh, because they've had such big bureaucracies for millennium, and you know, without internet, you know, whoever had the seal could do the business. <laughs> well, you're gonna. F I use the ring. I just go like this, and it would be hard to get it off my finger. But it is interesting. Yeah, it is. So, um, Bobby, will with your permission, we'll wait till after lunch sure. for yours. And it's always exciting. And maybe we break something we have lunch yet. We break for lunch. Good. Hmm? I'll come back to that. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, it's a seal. Yeah, it's a whatever it is in China. But chop is the seal the office. You stamp all your documents. So whoever has it has the power and yeah, can execute, you know, orders, spend money. You kill the people. Guy to get the chop. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. I can actually do it. Can you get in my class on time today? I have a 5 o'clock class on campus. I might be on it. <laughs> I haven't finished reading his book. I've been trying to stay up in the